We are recording in May 2022. For two and a half months, Ukraine has been resisting a horrendous military attack from Russia. Our topic today will be the three applications for membership of the European Union received from Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova in March, shortly after the war began. Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova are known as the association trio because they have been implementing association agreements with the EU for the last seven years or so. Another thing they have in common is that part of their territory is de facto occupied by Russia. None of these countries are in NATO, although Ukraine and Georgia have been knocking on the door for almost 20 years. All three countries have strong European aspirations. The upcoming European Council in June might decide to recognize the three countries as candidates for EU membership. The European Commission is currently preparing its opinions on the three applications. My guest today is Richard Youngs, Senior Fellow at the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program at Carnegie Europe, Professor at the University of Warwick, Visiting Professor at the College of Europe and author of over 15 books on EU foreign policy, democracy and Eastern Europe. Hello Richard. Morning Marian, thank you. Do you already know what the European Commission is going to recommend in relation to the three applications? Uh, no, as you said, it's uh, really still up in the air. The Commission is preparing its technical opinion. I think one thing we can uh, say um, is that this will not just be a matter of a technical opinion, but a very political judgment. And I suspect the technical opinion will be framed in those uh, terms. So I, I don't think we uh, know yet for certain uh, what will happen at the summit in June. There is an emerging debate around what kind of extra conditions or preconditions might be attached to recognizing the three countries as uh, candidates. So it may be that in the summit, once again, we don't get a definitive yes or no, uh, but we get member states kicking the can down the road a little bit more and saying to the three countries what kind of things they may need to do then later on to be a uh, formally recognized as candidates. Thank you, Richard. In your recent article, you wrote, and I quote, the arguments of those skeptical of enlargement to Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova look increasingly questionable on their own terms. But the EU will also need a different and much more politically engaged approach to accession to make a membership perspective relevant to the current context and challenges, especially in Ukraine. I propose that we tackle exactly these two major issues during our talk. Why skepticism about the candidacy of the association trio would be misplaced in the current context, and what sort of fresh thinking about the EU enlargement process is needed. When these applications were made, old concerns immediately came to the surface. EU's enlargement fatigue, EU's absorption capacity, and the challenge of implementing the full body of EU legislation. In addition, some member states still retain even now the instinct not to provoke Russia. Uh, instead of candidacy status um, to the association trio, some experts have been calling for privileged partnership, affiliated membership, or upgraded association agreements. Why would privileged partnerships not work in relation to Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, as opposed to offering them a clear perspective of EU membership? It's not just privileged partnership. Uh, there have been uh, similar ideas around for many, many years. Lots of uh, creative and inventive ways to offer countries uh, upgraded partnerships without going as far as offering them uh, full membership. Just in the last couple of weeks, uh, former leaders have suggested the idea of a European confederation. Uh, yesterday, President Macron raised the idea of a European political community. I think this notion is likely uh, to dominate debate for some time now. I don't think these are necessarily intrinsically bad ideas. They have a lot of sense, a lot of justification to them. I just don't think they're particularly helpful at this particular moment to the three countries we're talking about here, because these three countries already have a decade or more, or more of very structured, deep cooperation with the European Union. Um, so I'm not sure there's that much to add short of a membership offer. Let us not forget that the Eastern Partnership itself the association agreements, the DCFTAs, the deep and comprehensive free trade areas, uh, were all designed themselves as a kind of alternative to membership. So I think the three countries will feel that in a way we've already been round this circle, we've already considered and developed options that are alternatives uh, to membership. Uh, the three states, as you know, have been 
proceeding at different uh, speeds with a technical alignment uh, with the European Union key. They are already more advanced in that alignment than were previous uh, candidate states when they began the process of negotiation. So I think in that sense, in a way, we're already a little bit ahead of the state, the moment at which these alternatives to membership uh, could be useful. One realizes that skeptics will say that uh, the offer of membership is, at the moment is purely symbolic, that it will take many years, but I don't think we should um, be too dismissive of that symbolism. I think to me it's the, the symbolism of the membership offer that will uh, act as a kind of concrete anchor for the actions that particularly Ukrainians at the moment will need to both uh, prevail in the conflict but also to rebuild their country in a, a resilient and, and democratic uh, way. And uh, whether one thinks it's fair or not, I think any offer of a European political community, a confederation, a privileged partnership will be perceived uh, by countries in the region, by the three countries, not as being an upgrade, but as being a rejection, as being a rebuff. Let us not forget the EU has offered other countries privileged partnerships. For example, they offered Tunisia a privileged partnership in 2011, when President Bin Ali, one of the world's most repressive dictators, was still in power. So I think in that way, a privileged partnership would actually not be particularly privileged and will be um, perceived as such by the three countries. I agree, uh, Richard, also in, 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 in you saying that we should not dismiss the symbolism at all. The candidate status uh, would actually confirm to Ukrainians that they're not only fighting to defend their country, but also to defend their European choice. Now, um, many experts emphasize this, right, that the Ukraine's post-war reconstruction should happen within the framework of the accession uh, negotiations. What practical differences difference would the accession negotiations make uh, for the various reforms and investments to be undertaken as um, compared to the association relationship? Well, here I wouldn't overstate the case. I actually think the accession uh, framework is not absolutely essential uh, to any reconstruction uh, process. I mean, we still need to get to the stage where we're talking about reconstruction, not actually about the war. Um, and I don't think it's a panacea. It won't be an easy solution. I think it will bring certain advantages to the table. It will um, generate um, a kind of longer term institutional predictability for people in Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, fighting for reforms, trying to ensure that their countries are rebuilt in a more resilient, open and transparent way. It won't provide a magical solution, but I think it will fix a kind of end point that will act as an incentive for people in the region to organize their uh, reform plans. It will give the EU more leverage um, over those, uh, those reform plans and may unlock um, additional um, pockets of funding as well. So let us not think that reconstruction is only about the accession process. It is not. Uh, let us not forget that the accession process sh could also bring some downsides, some disadvantages as well. I think one lesson from the Balkans is that for countries coming out of conflict, the accession process can look a little bit overly heavy, overly bureaucratic. Um, it can be overly uh, focused on the EU's own requirements of alignment rather than what the countries in the region actually need, what candidate states actually need to rebuild themselves. So there are lessons to learn in terms of what should not be done under an accession framework. But I think you're right that the accession framework would bring a kind of structure and order uh, to the process of what we hope soon will be a process of reconstruction um, for Ukraine, as well as reform programs for Georgia and Moldova. There is an overwhelming support of Ukrainian, Georgian and Moldovan population for the EU membership of their countries. 91% of Ukrainians support EU membership of Ukraine, 80% um, of Georgians, and 70% of Moldovans support EU membership of their countries. Interestingly, only 11% of Georgians think that um, Georgia will never become part of the European Union. So the expectations are really high in all three countries. How about um, the citizens' perceptions and um, support for the EU enlargement to Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova in the EU 
So what do the European, European Union citizens think? And has the EU public opinion evolved after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in this February? I mean, all the opinion, opinion polls suggest that opinion has changed. Um, people across Europe are showing very strong solidarity, uh, in particular with Ukraine, and the surveys that have been carried out suggest that um, in most member states, public opinion now has turned in a very favorable direction towards offering uh, membership perspective to the three countries. Again, we shouldn't over, overly idealize the situation. If the three countries were to begin negotiations, it will be difficult to maintain that high level of support. Um, when, it get, when we get into the, the nitty gritty detail of uh, who will bear the costs for further <laughs> enlargement, then of course that will be the, the crucial uh, crunch moment at which uh, we will see whether how sustainable, how strongly rooted this favorable public opinion is. But certainly at the moment, it looks as if public opinion has rather, uh, is rather ahead of uh, government opinion on the uh, desirability of offering the three countries um, accession negotiations. Yes, if I may add, Richard, because I saw just very recent Eurobarometer survey just yesterday, which shows that 66% of EU citizens agree that Ukraine should join the EU when it's ready. 56% of, uh, of the French, 61% of the Germans, and 70% of the Italians think so. And uh, interestingly, only in Hungary, there is less than 50% support for Ukraine's EU membership. Now, Dutch um, population, 62% of Dutch population is also supportive of EU membership, but the Dutch government has been one of the most reticent um, in the recent days. Um, how could this gap that you just mentioned between the governments and the societies be explained? Because governments have been thinking in strategic terms, they've been thinking in terms of risk avoidance, uh, whereas one suspects that uh, citizens across Europe are perhaps moved by the more human side of the, of the conflict. I think it's understandable that governments have been concerned with um, geostrategic concerns in Europe. It's their job to focus on those concerns. I just think the uh, question now is whether they have been thinking about their geopolitical interests mm -hmm. uh, still holds. I think it's logical, it's understandable that they have wanted to avoid provoking Russia, as you said at the beginning, uh, and that maybe contributed to their hesitancy over enlargement. But in a way, that strategy, one could say, has failed. Russia has been provoked, it has acted. So I think that kind of strategic reasoning... Uh, has Russia been provoked? I mean, Russia has chosen to act, okay, what, whatever the, I mean, we can debate the underlying reasons for that, but I think it, my point is it changes, for me, the strategic calculus. Um, it, and in that sense, it seems to me that governments, even if they are thinking in primarily geopolitical terms, need to catch up and, and adjust their strategic thinking for, for events on the ground. And I think, for me, that's the answer to your question of how one might hope and expect the gap between government's hesitancy on the one hand mm -hmm. and public opinion's warmer support on the other hand uh, gradually to be, to be closed. The 1993 uh, Copenhagen conclusions include a statement that, the, um, uh, the, that peace and um, security in Europe depend on the post-communist transition uh, efforts of Central and Eastern European countries. Um, do you think that today EU leaders realize in a similarly enlightened spirit that peace and prosperity in Europe largely depends on Ukraine's preservation in this war and um, on the success of Ukraine's post-war reconstruction? I think they do, and I think that's one of the uh, very tangible changes that has come about uh, because of the invasion. At least if we, bil uh, we believe leaders in their speeches that uh, constantly um, stress exactly this argument you're making. I think diplomats certainly uh, get the case for this and get that, uh, understand that this is uh, the case. Uh, but I think that the debate amongst many diplomats and leaders is still whether uh, that uh, preservation of Ukraine and other countries in the region actually requires EU membership or not. And on that, clearly, they are still uh, divided. 
Uh, my hunch is that while I think they get the fact that the strategic context has changed, that the EU itself cannot survive, prosper, succeed without uh, greater strategic investment in the security of the three countries we're talking about here, uh, many would still argue that that can be done without offering the three candidates, uh, the three uh, countries candidate status. Uh, for me, it reflects uh, a preference for a kind of low cost investment in the region, uh, the EU trying to achieve its objectives without going as far as taking really a strong degree of responsibility for the strategic stability of the region. I think uh, the invasion should be a wake up call. Uh, it should move the EU beyond thinking that that suffices as a geopolitical strategy. I think during much of the 2010s, the EU put the region on kind of autopilot. Mm -hmm. um, and as we see now, that was not good enough. And in the wake of the invasion, I think we need to make sure governments don't at some stage have this temptation of swinging back into a kind of business as usual scenario. Is Ukraine's membership application an opportunity to strengthen and renew the EU itself? Or does it rather weigh on the EU as an obligation that potentially threatens its own EU integration? Where does the EU find itself between concerns over expanding voting rights to the new members and at the same time ambitions to be a geopolitical actor and a promoter of freedom, democracy and sustainable development? For me, Mariam, this is one of the most important questions and, and, you, and you phrase it very, very nicely because I think that even, what's striking to me is that even in the state's keenest uh, to move ahead with the accession uh, perspectives, um, the issue is still framed in rather negative terms. It's framed in terms of this being a kind of obligation um, and the debate being about how much of a cost the EU can bear in order to integrate the three uh, countries. So it's pitched in terms of the disadvantage to the EU and the EU having to reluctantly react to the new situation to consider these three countries' um, uh, applications. Uh, one could also say, I agree, that there uh, would be positives in incorporating the three countries. Uh, not that everything would be pos uh, positive. There will be costs to bear for the EU. There will be risks and uncertainties involved, but I think we can look at previous enlargements. On every a previous occasion when the EU has expanded, this has acted as a catalyst for further uh, deeper integration, stronger European cooperation. It strengthened the EU internationally. It's brought new assets, uh, capacities into the EU's ability to act as a geopolitical power. When one realizes that uh, the, skeptical, uh, the skeptics argue that the risk is that the three countries could act as kind of Trojan horses to bring in pro-Russian influences or destabilizing influences into the EU. But I think one could also flip that argument around and say that those influences are there in the three countries anyway, and that by incorporating the countries into the EU, the EU would actually have greater ability uh, to mitigate these risks, to re reduce this instability, and hold stronger political leverage over uh, geostrategic developments in the region. And in this sense, it would be of strategic benefit to the European Union. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't wish to overstate this case. Uh, there, 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 in, in many senses, there will be costs and difficulties and problems involved in incorporating the three countries. But I think you're absolutely right that we should flip round, we should uh, invert the way in which this whole issue is debated and recognize that the three countries, particularly Ukraine at the moment, could bring a lot to the table in terms of uh, sharing lessons in defending democratic values, uh, re-inspiring the European uh, project in, in the way that we've seen in developments on the ground in Ukraine. But what you're ultimately saying that some of the member countries are pretty much afraid that this new potential member states to the European Union would sort of paralyze the EU decision making with their vetoes, right? Um, recently, an, uh, an interesting proposal was published by the SEPS think tank in Brussels about the model of staged accession. And you are briefly referring to this model in your recent article as well. Um, that model of stage accession tries to address exactly that concern of the vetoes. Um, what do you think about this, this model? Do you think that it, uh, um, it could be useful um, as 
sort of new enlargement methodology? Uh, so I do think it can be useful. In fact, I think if enlargement is to um, uh, still survive as part of the European project, um, this kind of staged accession uh, thinking or framework will be necessary. So I think it is the future. But, but I think it depends on the detail. The devil is in the detail of what we actually mean by staged accession. I think the, the debate here is that uh, lots of people may support the principle of staged accession, but they mean very different things by it. So I think one logic is to think of staged accession as a way of speeding up the delivery of concrete benefits to candidate states. We all know from previous enlargements the risk is that candidate states are expected to take on a lot of EU legislation at great cost to themselves, great difficulty, but all the benefits of accession can come 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Uh, I think now it is clear that Ukraine, the other two countries, need more tangible benefits in the shorter term. And I think the, uh, the thinking that you referred to, the idea of gradually incorporating the three countries into certain sectors, certainly policy areas, as full members, as and when they are ready to act as full members in those policy areas, could help speed the process up and make sure that uh, accession preparations actually deliver concrete benefits to the three countries. And we don't get a situation where, uh, e even in the best of cases, the summit delivers a positive opinion on accession uh, status, and then uh, this, nothing happens. Uh, and the three countries are left to kind of in limbo, not getting any concrete benefit from the, pr the process for many, many years. I think the danger is, however, mm -hmm. that other people, uh, when they talk about staged accession, see it actually as a way not of speeding things up, but of right. slowing things down, mm -hmm. of putting off full membership almost indefinitely, not giving countries uh, full voting rights for a long time, uh, and perhaps or almost disingenuously relegating them on a fairly permanent basis to a second class uh, status of membership. So I think one needs to be careful. I think staged accession is a very good idea. It will be part of the future of enlargement, uh, but uh, personally I believe it should be couched and developed as a way of speeding up the delivery of benefits uh, rather than a, a, as a way of diluting or uh, slowing down fairly indefinitely the whole process of incorporating future members into the EU. To address another concern of those skeptical of enlargement, maybe we could briefly touch upon the principle of reversibility. The principle of reversibility is included in the EU enlargement methodology. If a candidate slides back in terms of human rights uh, and uh, democracy, rule of law, um, the accession negotiations and related EU financing can be uh, scaled back or even suspended. Will this principle help convince those uh, member states that are skeptical that it is right to give candidacy status now when it's so much needed to Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova because the accession process is anyways reversible in case candidate countries slide back from democracy and drift away from the European Union? Uh, I think you're right, Mariam, the process of reversibility is already there. Um, but I think uh, put, b putting this on a more formalized basis could help reluctant states. I don't think it's a solution, a magic solution. I don't think this is the main reason why states are skeptical about offering uh, accession process uh, status now, but it could help the process. Um, I think that here concerns are legitimate. The EU's been badly burnt by the experience of Hungary and Poland. Of course, the EU's are already going through its own internal process of change and reform in order better to address these dangers of backsliding amongst current member states. So in this sense, the EU that Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova would join would already be a different EU, hopefully better equipped to deal with these problems of democratic backsliding than it has been over the last several years in the case of Hungary and Poland. So in that sense, I think these are legitimate concerns, but I don't think they're a reason mm -hmm. to rebuff uh, the applications of the three countries we're talking about here. It speaks in favor of the EU reforming its own internal processes uh, rather than simply saying no indefinitely to these three candidate states. The reversibility needs, again, to strike a fine balance 
uh, reversibility is needed in order for the EU to retain leverage over countries' democratic reform processes. But if there's too much reversibility, the EU can actually lose leverage over those reform processes. If reversibility is too easy, as we've seen in the Balkans, then reformers can uh, make the, arrive at the judgment that the EU is never going to actually deliver on its promises, and therefore the, the incentivizing value of the accession uh, preparations, the accession process can actually be very seriously diluted. So that is one lesson that I would draw from the Balkans, uh, that the, the degree of reversibility actually needs to be pitched at the right kind of level. Richard, just recently we celebrated the Europe Day, the 72nd anniversary of the Schuman Declaration. The European communities were created since the 1950s as a, as a European peace project, right? European integration was very uh, closely linked to uh, the post-Second World War reconstruction of Europe. Do you see parallels with the uh, current war in Ukraine uh, and uh, 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 the need of its uh, reconstruction in the coming years. Can Ukraine's reconstruction become a new chapter in the EU history and a new purpose uh, for the Union? I think it can, and again, uh, you uh, frame it very well. I, I wouldn't be overly idealistic about this, but I, th I certainly think that it opens this window of opportunity uh, to try and revive the, 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 the kind of normative or, or moral value of the European uh, project and re revive its attractiveness to citizens in that sense. I, th I certainly think it brings back the, the geopolitics to the heart of the European project it, the, in, in, in many ways similar to the way that the um, origins of the European project were, were prompted by this very, very kind of existential political uh, value. At the same time, I don't think we can go back to exactly the same kind of political logic that underpinned the creation of the European communities. I think that narrative, that um, framing of the project needs to be updated for today's circumstances. I think today the European project is, cannot just be about managing relations between states, between governments. It also needs to be about uh, building a common uh, community of democratic values between citizens. So I would shift the focus of the narrative of the European project away from governments and interstate relations uh, onto, the on, onto a focus of uh, citizens sharing common democratic values across borders. And I think here is where we could see a very positive, strong positive value of what's happening in Ukraine and um, uh, if, if uh, things out turn, turn out well in Ukraine, in this sense, Ukraine being able to add value and dynamism uh, back into the European project. Richard, how likely is it to get a political agreement on the candidacy status for all um, three countries at the upcoming June uh, European Council meeting? I think it's far from guaranteed, but it's, uh, I think things are looking more positive than they were several weeks um, ago. I think the, the language is likely to be fairly positive coming out of the summit, whether it's a definitive, absolutely unequivocal uh, offer of candidate status to the three countries is, I think, the question. It may be that member states send a positive political signal, but at the same time, they ask for certain things to be done, reforms uh, for the, in the three countries prior to accession uh, talks actually beginning. Of course, we have to remember uh, Ukraine is still at war here. We are talking about hopefully a situation where there is a degree of political stabilization that would allow accession processes to actually begin. But I think that uh, reminds us that this is a key strategic moment. And I think this is the moment at which the EU can play this strategic card. It can show the geopolitical value of an enlargement offer. The, the member states will not struggle to come up with lots of very clever diplomatic ways of not offering um, uh, candidate status to the three countries, of delaying the process. This is easy for the EU to do, but I think there will be a strategic cost in them doing so. I think there's a legitimate debate about the whole future of the enlargement process. 
um, and the uh, structure of the European Union in relation to its neighbors, countries like Turkey, the Balkans, the UK even, North Africa, there is that debate to be had. Uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova will need to fit into that debate, but I think the strategic uh, fragility of the current situation means we shouldn't uh, mix up too much this broader debate with the, what these three countries need in tangible terms, in, in terms of political symbolism as well, at this moment. Thank you very much, Richard, for your insights. And thank you all for watching. I had a pleasure to speak to Professor Richard Young from Carnegie Europe. We will be back with further episodes soon. See you next time.